Hello everybody, welcome to the next session of the Mindful Drinking Festival and one of our expert Q&As. Um, I'm really excited to have with us this evening Veronica Vallely or today actually, what time is it where you are Veronica? Oh, let me... It's, it's, the, it's 11 a.m. in the morning. <laughs> yeah, so if you're watching in America, it's early in the day. If you're watching the UK, it's late in the day. And if you're in Australia, you're in bed. Um, but um, but I'm really excited to have Veronica here because we haven't done a Q&A with Veronica before. And when I first started Club Soda, Veronica was one of the first people that I touched base with. Um, and she was incredibly supportive about what we were trying to do. And we had some great conversations about British drinking culture. Because actually, you're, you're British, Veronica, but you live in America. That's right. Yeah, I'm uh, from the UK. From I grew up in East Anglia, um, and I've been back and forth between England and the States since I was about 19. I did a lot of my drinking and rock bottoming in America, got sober in America, went back to England, went back to England, met an American, came back to America. Excellent. And um, you were also, I guess, the, set, the same generation as me, so we're a bit of the ladette generation. Yeah, it's really it's so interesting because I have clients all over the world. And whenever I get a Brit in front of me who's roughly my age, I ne I, I would say to them, you know, I could say, tell me about your drinking, but I know exactly how your drinking was. Because we were from that 90s generation where it was sold to us as kind of almost feminism, right? That we were equal and we could drink with the lads and a hundred percent convinced that alcohol was the best way to have fun I was having a great time so I, I bet our drinking was very similar well I think it was a little bit of a perfect storm of things actually so one was that you know drinking pints with the lads at equal um, pace was equality and the second was is that um, uh, single sex socializing in the pub became to become less popular. Leaving the wife at home with the kids was a no-no. So couples then started drinking together at home. And the price of wine came down and mm. went to the supermarkets and became something that you would drink at home, which was the first time that had happened. And I do think that there's a perfect storm of, of mixture of, of gender politics at play in terms of, of women entering, the, more women being in the workplace and men being part of childcare, along with cheap wine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and the expansion of the nighttime economy, you know, it was the real deliberate kind of, you know, all bar one, those kind of like where pubs were very, that, that were sort of quite hostile to women. But places like all bar one, you know, the, the way they designed that very purposefully was for women to feel comfortable going, having, having, you know, drinks together after work, all of that kind of stuff that wasn't there for our mothers, but it was very yeah. much there for us. It was, it was horrible pubs with sticky carpets and darts. Yeah. Um, yeah. I lived in one. So, you know, uh, but that's interesting because actually all bar one has moved with the trends though, because actually food is the biggest thing that you, mm. that, that they sell in all bar one and they have mm. got some of the best alcohol free menus. So mm. there's some sort of Good for them. There. Good for them. Um, but that's that brings me to a really important question. So you gave up when you were 27. So you gave up a good 10, 11 years before me. At 27, I'm not sure if I could even have contemplated that. That's a really young age. When you, the, the, day, the day that you gave up, did you know that that was going to be forever? No, and I didn't give up because I wanted to give up. I um, gave up because I was out of options. So I, my drinking from my first drink is what I would describe as alcoholic. I was never able to control my drinking. I mean, I was 15 years old, you know, back, this is like the late 80s, early 90s, where you could get into pubs and clubs if you looked old enough. I mean, I was I was going to nightclubs at 14. Um, and I remember being 15 years old um, outside of a bar in Thetford in Norfolk, where I grew up, coming out of blackout, covered in my own vomit, with the landlord throwing a bucket of water over me. And I remember kind of thinking, this is like, like, whoa, this is not right. And everybody around me, Laura, went, oh, my God, Branka, that was such a great night. You are so crazy. And I went, oh, OK, that's fun. That's like, I'm crazy. Like, I, and, and I just like my whole culture and everyone around me reinforced that what I had just done was fun. And that's Isn't very, very. It, really, yeah, and it was always like that. I mean, it wasn't always in the gutter, but it was always like nine times out of 10, my drinking was messy and awful and I can't remember it and it was a train wreck. But my culture kept telling me that was fun. 
And of course, we love positive reinforcement. We love things mm. that people tell us they enjoy and they like about us. That became something people, your your excessive drinking became something people liked about you and became mm-hmm. to find you quite early on. Mm-hmm. Um, that's quite something. So you, I mean, I was drinking at 15 as well, um, 14 and 15. And, um, but, uh, you know, my, my pattern of drinking is slight, slightly different, but not much, <laughs> I have to say, not much. But you, you, you got to a dark place really quickly. How did that manifest itself through your twenties? Well, I had um, my drinking, and I want to say my drug use as well, because I want to say our generation. There's not many people who just drink alcohol. That you know, drug use was growing, uh, and, and I used a lot of you know cocaine, that kind of stuff. And uh, I then had subsequently a lot of mental health problems. I, I had. Um, I was in psychosis by the time I was 18, which is when drug induced psychosis, which is when my drinking changed. Like in my head, I began to drink to cope. Like if I had something to go to, I'd want a glass of wine before I went to it. So it changed from like just binge drinking, partying to needing to drink to, to, to feel okay. Um, I still was never a daily drinker. I didn't drink first thing in the morning, but it, you know, it was not good. And so I had anxiety and I had panic attacks, which I now know from my work is pretty much universal with pretty much everybody who has an alcohol problem has suffers from anxiety. You know, it's it's a central nervous system depressant. So I was depressed. So I had I was suicidal for many years, desperately looking for the solution. And I would present at different services and I went everywhere. I, I've been to psychiatrists and psychologists and churches and anybody who seemed like they could help me. And I would present with my mental health problems and they were trying to treat my mental health problems. And I honestly can't recall how much people asked me about my drinking, but I'm sure I minimized it. I, I, I don't, no professional ever picked up that alcohol was actually the root of this. So by the time I got to 27, I was just desperate. I was so desperate. I couldn't, like on the outside, I kind of looked okay. Like I've never even been fired from a job. I've never had a drink driving incident, but on the inside, I was coming apart. Like I, I just felt so desperate. I felt so very alone. I, I never felt safe. And I didn't, I just didn't know how to get out of that. So I got to this place where some I met someone who explained what alcoholism was and something began to click. And and so I stopped drinking at 27 because it was suggested to me that that would clear up my mental health problems. Now I was not, I I was like most people completely invested in the belief system that alcohol was the best way to have fun, excitement, belonging, connection, to relax, to reward myself and to get romance and sex. So I felt enormous grief that I was going to be giving up all of that. I'm 27. Like my life is over. My peer group are going out at the weekend having amazing times or how I perceived they were having an amazing time. I was kind of going to be like a sort of nun, just very grey, just sipping a cup of tea and my life was over. So did you uh, did you think at 27 that was the price you were going to have to pay? Oh, yeah. to 100%. 100%. And I, like I said, I wasn't happy about that, but I accepted it because the anxiety and panic attacks were so bad. I was prepared to do anything. to do. What I wanted was peace. I just wanted to peace. I I knew my life was over. I knew I was never going to have fun again. I knew I was definitely never going to get laid again, but I would have some peace. And I was, that's what I wanted. And I, I grudgingly accepted that. And I want to go back slightly because you said something quite important, which is you weren't an everyday drinker. You didn't like Mm -hmm. drinking when you woke up in the morning. Mm -hmm. And sometimes people feel that that's the, that's the only sign that you've got a problem with drinking Mm -hmm. and not the other things that you've talked about, which is, you know, panic attacks, anxiety, um, feelings of shame and guilt, mm-hmm. all of those things that come along with drinking. Yeah. And, you know, for me, I wasn't a daily drinker, but I was talking to people about, um, oh gosh, just, just you know, the hangovers were so terrible. And I, it was like, it was an extreme sport and I was seeing how much I could get away with. So whilst I didn't drink every day, it was only because the days that I wasn't drinking, I felt so chronically awful. So mm-hmm. it's not like there was some skipping through the roses one day and drunk the next. It wasn't anything that, you know, these are terrible patterns to be in. Yeah, I was. That's exactly how I was. So, so first thing is, 
Um, I'm highly allergic to alcohol. So I was a sort of, my pattern was sort of like Thursday, my, the best I felt was like Thursday morning. So Thursday night, go out for drinks after work, feel a bit shitty at work Friday, kind of get through with like the hair of the dog at lunchtime, out after work on Friday, drink Saturday, Sunday, spend all Sunday usually in bed, crawl through Monday and Tuesday, feel a bit better on Wednesday, Thursday morning, feel amazing and do it all again. And then if I had something where like I couldn't, my anxiety, I couldn't be in crowds, I couldn't be in groups. So like if I was like, like I would have to, like say I had to go to a workshop for work or something like that, I would have a glass of wine before I went to just, um, so I, so I was very allergic to it. But the thing, the thing is, it's not about the drinking. I was so uncomfortable in my own skin. I, I couldn't bear being me. And alcohol relieved that. And, and also so did cigarettes and so did men and so did um, drugs and prescription drugs. And all, it was outside fixes to inside problems. So that, that's, I think, the first big misconception is ha judging whether you have an alcohol problem by how much you drink and how often you drink. Because it's not about that. It's much more to do with the internal emotional stuff. Yeah, absolutely. So at 27, you did you go into 12 step program? Is that what you did? What do you do? Yeah, so I got sober in 2000, which was um, back then the internet was barely a thing. Um, I mean, I think I had a Hotmail account. So back when I got sober, there wasn't anything else. There was really maybe two options going away to a rehab or going to AA. And I had no resources. So I went to AA because that's all there was. Um, and I was lucky that I, I entered into a really strong fellowship with women who had really solid sobriety. Um, and I sat there for weeks, not relating, thinking this is not like what I, I, um, uh, I just thought it was going to be through the smelly old men. Um, but you know, there was teachers and there was, did you go, and... did you go to AA in the States or the UK? Yeah, Florida. In Florida. in Florida yeah I was gonna say because it may have been slightly different here because there are the, the drug and alcohol services back then had money <laughs> and more yeah. resources yeah so. but, you know I want to say even then, then I mean I've worked in the alcohol services in the UK and they still view abstinence as like extreme I, I want to say a lot of the alcohol services are still pushing moderation on people that really need to be there's a fear of abstinence yeah. I think I think so, yeah, they've got a harm reduction strategy I think yeah so. And this is, so just to go off on a tangent, difference between England and America, America is very, very, very much in abstinence and they need some more harm minimization. And the UK is is very, very much harm minimization and they need a bit more abstinence. That's the difference, we, but both things. Um, so I, I sat, sat in 12-step meetings, not identifying, not relating, didn't see how this was relevant to me. And I don't know why I kept going, but I think I think once I stopped drinking, I didn't have any friends or anything else to do. And I I was in this, I kept going. Anyway, I heard, one day I heard someone talk about fear and it was a, a middle-aged man. And he spoke about how he was consumed with fear, fear of what people thought of him, fear of not being good enough. And, and that's why he drank. And I just sat there and went, oh my God, I thought I was the only one on the planet who felt that way. I thought you were all okay. And everyone else in the room was like, yeah, that's how I felt. And I was like, oh, because that's why I drink. I drink because I am so consumed with fear of everything and not being good enough. And I'm, I'm so uncomfortable in my own skin. And that was the light bulb moment for me that I realized that I did, I tried to fix myself all the time and numb myself with all of these feelings that were going on inside and I needed to change that. And 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 they said, the solution is to do the 12 steps and get a sponsor. I went, okay, sign me up. Where do I? I was desperate. Like I had spent, I, I started to look for help when I was 18. So I was desperate for someone to say, this is what you need to do to be okay. And that's what they did. They said, this is what you need to do to be okay. And I'm like, I'll do it. I'll do it. I just well, want I'm, to feel okay. I'm but what I'm also hearing is it took listening to a lot of stories for the one that really mm -hmm. pinged as a light yeah. bulb to get to yeah. you. And my brother's now just done two and a half years alcohol free and he did an interview for us um, and he, he's got, he had issues with um, cannabis as well, but it was going to the festival and hearing people talk about anxiety that where it clicked for him. So despite, you know, spending all of coming to our festivals and spending time with me and knowing what we do, it was hearing somebody whose experience was more similar to him 
yeah. that was the light bulb moment. Yeah. And I think you can't underestimate trying to surround yourself with as many stories and reading as many books and listening to as many podcasts as possible because not everything will speak to you. But then the one thing that that is important will, and that's where, where it will click. I 100% agree. And, and again, back when I got sober, nobody was talking about this publicly. So when yes. I got sober, you would hear a celebrity rock bottom story, but nobody was talking about this publicly. And I was, you know, I went on to work in the field and I've been, you know, worked as a psychotherapist and all, all kinds of different things in the UK. And it was sort of like encouraged that you keep those things separate. And I eventually started coming out because, you know, the first thing is, you know, there's, there's a discussion about the words we use and using the words alcoholic. And I understand that. I use that word to describe myself because I, I, I'm a rebel. I love, I, you know, I'm a middle class mummy with two boys, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I love it when people ask me, oh, how did you get into it? Oh, I'm a recovered alcoholic and cocaine addict. And I love seeing the like, like, I, I don't fit what that looks like. And I think it's really important to challenge those stereotypes and also to show people that we recover and my life is just normal and blah, 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 blah. So um, back, I started speaking out many, many years ago. I had a blog like over 15 years ago. And, you know, I used to do some TV and radio and stuff in the UK where I used to talk about this because it, it's like it's this secret shameful thing. And then, in the, you know, since Club Soda has been around in, in the last few years, this Instagram accounts, I can't imagine waking up as I was 21 years ago and seeing on Instagram someone saying, oh, I'm 200 days sober. And I'm feeling, I'd be like, what? It was a very secret, shameful thing when I first got sober. And I'm very pleased to see that that has changed because it needs. But it's, to. it's still only very recent, really, because, you know, yeah. when I grew up nine and a half years ago, there was nothing, which is why I wanted mm -hmm. to set up Club Soda. So, yeah. you know, it, you know, you'd still draw up a blank. And I, and I knew where the drug and alcohol services were because I'd been responsible for commissioning them. So, you know, it was still about, you know, finding the right thing and, and, and that sort of stuff. So, yeah. Yeah, so we, we, I mean, we've come a long way in the 21 years that I've been sober. There is so much more visibility and, and we have to, you know, I still, you see it all the time in the press, you know, you see someone, I, I remember a few years ago, if you remember um, James Gandolfini, the actor who was in The Sopranos, he, he died mm -hmm. suddenly and, and, and there was an outpouring of, oh, so sad and so wonderful. And around the same time, there was the actor, oh gosh, his name's just gone. He died of a heroin overdose. He played... Um, Truman Capote, amazing actor. He was in oh. the Hunger Games. Um, yes, I also can't remember his name. You know, right now. Okay, it, you know who I mean. Yeah, he, he died of a heroin overdose, and there was a whole kind of like, oh my god, how could you do that? He has young children. It's such a waste of talent, and it's like that happens all the time. Now, James Gandolfini, God bless him. He does. I think it was a heart attack. You only had to look at the guy to see that he probably wasn't the healthiest of. Folk. Yeah, but there was no kind of like he did it to himself in the same way that it was with the actor whose name escapes us who will come to us. I'm soon. gonna find yeah. it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, uh, I'm gonna find it. Um, Veronica, would you mind taking your headphones off a bit because they're beginning to to rub oh. on your shirt a lot. Um, and it's should it's, I hold it? Is it better like that if I hold? Yeah, it? that that helps. It's something okay. got very. Yeah, very, I know. Um, Philip Seymour Hoffman. Philip Seymour Hoffman, that's the one. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and, and so uh, we still have a long way to go where people still feel, look at this as a moral issue and a willpower issue. Yeah. And, and I think we've made great strides, but we still need to, and, and that's why I'm very passionate in my work. I talk about that this isn't, this is an internal problem. We behave how we feel. So if someone is drinking so that they pass out in their own vomit, it, that's to do with what's going on inside of them and how they feel about themselves. And uh, that's, I think we still need to talk a lot more about that. Yeah, I'm going to come on to that again in a minute, but I just want to go back to the 27-year-old yeah. you. And yeah. you thought your life was um, that you you were going to basically become a nun. Um, uh, I really uh, did. <laughs> and... How quickly did that begin, that perception begin to change for you? So I want to say in certainly the first year-ish, all I did was work 
exercise, hang out with sober people and go to 12 step meetings. And, you know, I, I remember, you know, like on a Friday, Saturday night, that those that was always very hard. And I would, um, you know, go to a meeting, go, usually go for dinner with someone afterwards, coffee, blah, blah, blah. And that kind of filled the time. I remember one Saturday night cleaning my apartment from top to bottom and thinking, is this it? <laughs> Like it, it wasn't, it didn't feel great, but the alternative was always so much worse. And I remember about 11 months sober, I met some people who were about the same age and we wanted to go dancing. I love dancing. I love dancing. So we went out as a group to a bar because that felt safe. And uh, we went and we danced and it was really weird. And then we did it again. And then, and then it didn't feel so weird. And then what happened is my life just began to expand. I came back to the UK. I started working in a rehab. I was beginning to make a wide circle of sober friends. And I had friends from, you know, some friendships still left people who, you know, drank. And and I just, things just began to happen. So I want to say, I don't know when it was, probably within two years. I, I want to I say having fun in sobriety is really, really important. And I always say to people, I, I've done everything. I've done the V Festival. I've gone to South of France on holiday. I've been to every wedding and barbecue and festival. And I've seen tons of bands and I've done it all sober and it's all been better. So it's, it's at first of all, it feels like this is the end of the world and everything is growing boring. Then it feels really weird. Like the first time you dance or the first, like I do remember just to, like the first time you have sober sex is slightly terrifying um and then you know you start doing things and it's a bit strange and then it becomes normal and then you kind of your perception really shifts and that's all sobriety is sobriety is simply a shift in perception is that mm. the world hasn't changed it's just we see everything differently um I you know I party I, I was always you know I had a group of friends like I said I love dancing we'd go out in Cambridge to nightclubs I would be the designated driver by about 12.30, I'm usually done because that's when people get messy drunk. I've danced for a couple of hours. I've flirted. I go home. I wake up, go for a run on Sunday morning, feel pretty good. I, it just, it, it, it takes a little bit of time, but it was such a relief to realize that everything I thought about sobriety was wrong. Everything. And and that I, I so many times I'd go to an event and go and be like, oh my God, that I had such a great time. And I was very clear that I had such a great time because I was sober, fully connected to myself and fully connected to the experience and the people around me. I mean, I don't know if you've been to like before lockdown to like events, like a, like a gig, for instance, mm -hmm. and people are getting wasted. And I'm like, they're spending half their time in the bathroom and the other half their time in their sort of own little bubble. Whereas like, I am like, or queuing yeah. the car or yeah, thinking about yeah. the next drink yeah. and all that. Yeah. Where I am connected to the experience and the artist and the people that I'm with. And and you experience a high from that. The, yeah. the high you can get in sobriety is of, it, for me, it's like the difference between, you know, like uh, organic orange juice and like sort of artificial orange squash. It's like, you know, the difference when you taste the difference, it's like there's no comparison. It, it's funny because Millie talks about the fact that she organizes all these sorts of fun things for their friendship group that aren't orientated around alcohol. And while some of them are not sure about doing them at the beginning, A, everyone has a really great time. But also when people talk about, you know, things they've done, everyone always recounts the things that Millie had organized. Nobody recounts the the night in the pub where they just drank cocktails again. They all talk about the white water rafting and the 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 theatre and the brunches and all of that sort of stuff. So, you know, it they wouldn't be, you know, they're enhancing for everybody. And therefore imagine what that's like if you're sober, that you you found these new things, that they give you pleasure and they give you great joy and you know, and you can get highs from the whole experience. And I do too, you know, I used to, I, I'm a big theatre goer and mm. just being able to remember the second half of the play and reflect on it as I sit on the tube home is actually a really important thing for me. I get a lot of energy from from seeing people perform like you do with music and then being able to reflect on that and say, yeah, 
Yeah, and that it's it's really really essential. And and the other thing is is what what I realized is like I traveled around America when I was drinking, and it's like you go to these incredible places, but you have I was having the same experience that I was having in a bar in Kings Lynn in Norfolk. You know, it's like find the local Irish bar, get drunk with a bunch of strangers, feel hungover, go to the place of interest, kind of hungover, like cutting it short because I just want to go. You know. And, and what happens when you get sober is your life, and I guarantee this, it, is it expands. So things, I, you would do things that you never would do when you were drinking because, you know, things where you get up early, you wouldn't do it because you were hungover and, and have just like all of these different experiences. And that happened to me a lot in the first few years. It's like, I never would have done this. And I never like, wow, this is incredible. And You underestimate how much you reorientate the way your life works to accommodate hangovers and everything. Yes. You don't do it consciously. Yeah. You do it subconsciously. You you will never meet people before 11 on a Saturday and and yeah. you, will, you know, want to you get to places early so you can sit in the bar and have a drink first. And they're all subconscious, but when you you give up drinking, you realize how much of that you do and how much therefore you know the the thief of time that alcohol is isn't just about the drinking, the, the act of drinking, but all of those bits around it where you've re, rejigged your life to accommodate it. So I talk about that in respect to bandwidth in that we only yeah. have a finite amount of bandwidth. And when we have an alcohol problem and people with an alcohol problem do four things. They drink, they think about drinking, they think about not drinking and they recover from drinking. And that takes bandwidth to do those things the argument that you have with yourself about whether you're going to drink tonight or what do other people know I'm drinking too much or maybe I should cut down that takes energy and headspace now the thing is and you're probably a great example of this uh, uh, we can do that's like 20 30 percent of our ba bandwidth sacrifice to that pursuit you can do a lot with 70 percent. you can get a degree you can have a career you can do all those things but what you can't do is emotionally grow the way that we're meant to because you don't have access to that bandwidth. Oh so, God, yes, it's a really good way of putting it. <laughs> Such a good so way when you it. when we get sober, we get access to bandwidth we've never had before, and that Laura is where our extraordinariness is. Yes. Our extraordinariness is in accessing our full bandwidth, and that's the experience we're meant to have here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's um it it's because it's 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 not just about time it's not just about energy it's also about your brain capacity your ability to comprehend things your ability to understand what you're feeling and and connect to that and um it's uh it's and all of those things combined then sort of add extra you know together they they become a, a really potent combination that allows you to live and and it's by no means all perfect either. So Veronica, you know, because you've talked about the fact that we we drink for all sorts of inner reasons, and some of those inner reasons don't go away when you're not drinking. Mm -hmm. And I've often seen people go, "Well, I'm I'm still miserable um, and unhappy. Um, so clearly, giving up drinking isn't working for me." And I just want to wrap my arms around these people and say that no, now you've got space to deal with the thing that's making you miserable and unhappy, and and you've got the um, that bandwidth to deal with it. Um, you know, tell us a little bit more about that and what you've seen through your experience and working with your clients. Yeah, I, I hear that a lot as well. And again, it's this big. It's a misconception that alcohol is the problem, and if I just eliminate that, everything else will be fine. So the thing is, you've probably got a lot of people who had some a lot of emotional issues and trauma before they even started drinking. Um, and and uh, they discover alcohol and it becomes such a great anesthetic. So they have all that stuff that was there before they even started. But then there's the whole thing about when we drink abusively, we traumatize ourselves. You know, I, I think I mean, I know I look back and know I was very, very lucky that some horrible things didn't happen to me when I was drinking, but I put myself in very dangerous situations. And I, um, ha there's a lot of things I regret that I have, you know, that at the time I had a lot of shame about. So even, so then we have a drinking career that kind of creates these feelings of shame and, yeah. and we practice and guilt and fear. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. And, and, and we lose, we kind of lose ourselves. This is really the, the kind of crux of it. 
when we abuse alcohol, we move away from who we really are. We lose ourselves. So sobriety is really about the journey back to ourselves. And I want to talk about this because we, you, um, trauma is the root of all addiction. It's the root of all alcohol problems. And I will get people for every so often say to me, you know, I had a great childhood. My parents were wonderful. There was no abuse or anything like that. And this is how I want, how I answer that. When we are children, we have two essential needs, attachment, which we know about. We know how important attachment is for infants and children. And it's important all through our life. It's particularly when we are young. And we also have the need of authenticity, which is to be who we really are. So we can grow up in a very loving family where, you know, there's no, no one's hitting us or abusing us. But there's a very clear, accepted way of how to be. And often some of us have to sacrifice our authenticity in our families for our attachment needs to be met. A good example of that, Laura, is somebody who would grow up who, who's who's gay in yeah, a family. Yeah, I was say, there's that, a big flag for growing up yeah, gay and yeah, why the gay yeah. community has such a, the queer yeah. community has such yeah. a issue with yeah. alcohol. <laughs> because because we, we all know as children, like I, I have like you know depending on what age we are we need our families for our survival right we we have to be accepted and and fit and so that they'll love and look after us so many and it's not you know I think that's the best example is people who do grow up in that situation who are gay but I think there's many for me in my family they did not do any emotions my family's emotional range is like that like any big feelings were shut down and I have really big feelings. So it was constantly messaged to me that how you are, Veronica, is not acceptable to us. So I sacrificed my authenticity. And the thing is, I didn't know how to get it back when I was an adult. I, I didn't know how to reclaim it as an adult. And the pain of that is it, it, we can't underestimate the pain of that. Alcohol is such a wonderful anesthetic. But also, you know, that there's another part of that, and that it reminds me of uh, one of the club soda members who I who had also been through a twelve step, who who managed to pinpoint the fact that when she was very young at school, that feeling of wanting to be accepted by friends yeah. was really important. And so, when drinking yeah. became a way to feel accepted, and even yeah. you just talked about the fact that friends reinforced the fact that you were great to be with when you were drinking. Yeah. So, yeah. even that feeling of belonging is something that. Um, we use out, you know, that they are small. They 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 might be small, but they are yeah. incredibly significant. A hundred percent. It all chips away at our authentic mm -hmm. self, and and alcohol, alcohol just solves all problems in the moment, right? It it takes away the pain. It's a it's a, such a quick, easy vehicle to fit in and be accepted, you know. And 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 that's the whole attachment needs being met. So sobriety is really our journey back to our authentic selves yes yeah. because also at that time of childhood we are we're already socialized in a, a society that suggests that alcohol is the answer to all that pain and we're probably learning drinking behaviors from our parents too even if they might not be big drinkers they will certainly be drinking and normalizing it so you know mm. add all of that on top and it's a whole pile of shit isn't it <laughs> yeah and going back to your question when we sacrifice our authentic selves to fit in and be attached, we develop certain behaviors. So we tend to not have very good boundaries. We tend to be quite people pleasers in that we say yes a lot when we mean no. And, and these are all life skills that we just don't have. So when we stop drinking with that bit, that's a foundation stone. But what you're left with is someone who doesn't know how to have boundaries, who doesn't know how to have emotional mastery. I mean, and that's the big one is they don't understand how they feel. They don't know how to deal with fear. They don't know how to deal with rejection. They don't know how to deal with disappointment because they've just defaulted to a substance. So that's why when people stop drinking, if they're still miserable and unhappy, it's because they're not emotionally sober. Emotional sobriety is about doing doing that deeper work, learning how to have boundaries, all of these skills that we didn't usually didn't pick up when we were children because it wasn't role model to us, but we just never had the opportunity to learn because we were just numbing. No, and um you know that I I've, I've seen it a lot that um people say that your emotional literacy stops when you start drinking. And yeah. certainly that was definitely the case for me. We're emotional and, teenagers. You know, it, it doesn't mean that you suddenly have to jump into tons of self-help books, but you need to begin to spend some time reflecting 
um, mm. and and recognizing. And for me, it felt like a hundred little epiphanies. You know, I would I would respond differently to a stimuli that normally would have made me fly off the handle. And I realized it was possible to control that emotion. I'd be like, wow, I've suddenly just become a better version of myself. Or I was able to read a whole newspaper article and think, hmm, I think there's a way to solve this. And and I would be constantly surprising myself in the months after giving up drinking that the these things that I, I was when I was in my 20s, that I thought I had in my 20s were, were open again to me now. And that I was able to do that. And I was able to feel that and understand that and um, therefore control my behaviors um, in a way that alcohol never gave me any capacity to control anything. Yeah, and I want to say, in my experience, the three most important things ev that everybody needs to work on, and I always emphasize this to my clients, by the way, this is not just for people with an alcohol problem. What, what I do is personal development for sober people. Everybody on the planet needs to do personal development, which is to know oneself better. So this isn't just us. We, we are the fortunate ones that we've kind of got this like shove into knowing how important it is. And the three, for me, the three things that will transform your sobriety and anybody's life is um, boundaries, um, being able to deal with resentments and being able to change your limiting beliefs. And those th three things are skills that you can learn. Oh, so um, you can make me realize I need to still work on all three <laughs> of those. And I thought I was doing so well. <laughs> you know, there's always more work to be done. And, mm. and those three things will transform your life. And I'll, I'll give you an example. When I was dating my husband back years ago, um, it, it, we had a date set up for a Friday night. I think we were going for dinner. And he called me kind of late and said, honey, I'm really sorry. There's a, um, a lecture on. He was at uh, University of Cambridge that I've just found out about that I really want to go to because it's to do my PhD. Can we reschedule? And I was like, sure, no problem. You know, I was maybe a little bit disappointed, but no big deal. I understood it. And I was like, well, I've got a free Friday night. I think I probably went to a meeting and met some friends afterwards and hung out. And then we had a nice weekend. And it was like Sunday night that it kind of had this realization, kind of what you were saying, this epiphany where I was like, wow, years ago, if he had done that, that would have gone straight into the limiting belief I had about myself that I wasn't good enough and that I wasn't worthy of being loved because you canceled this. Date. I mean, I don't care about the reason, like you canceled a date with me and that must be because I'm not good enough. And I would have sulked and I would have punished him and I would have ruined the whole weekend to get him to grovel enough to be sorry enough that I felt better about myself. And I kind of went, man, I used to behave like that because of the belief system I had and it's gone. Like it's yeah, gone. It's we had a perfectly, I had a nice Friday night. He did his thing and we had a lovely weekend. I'd have ruined that whole weekend. And that's because I yeah. changed my limiting beliefs about myself. It's, it, it's so true. And it's so powerful when you realize that you can, you can control your feelings and you don't have to let those feelings ruin, you know, because often when you're angry, you know, you think you're punishing other people, but oh boy, you're punishing yourself. And when you're resenting yeah. other people, you're yeah. punishing yourself. And 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 you can never control that when you're you're drunk and hungover. So um, yeah, and and that's what's going on underneath an alcohol problem. So when the alcohol has you've stopped drinking alcohol, that stuff is all there. And I I don't think I've ever met anybody who's stopped drinking and hasn't got stuff that they just need to address. Oh, oh gosh, we could talk for ages, and I realize we're getting near the end of our time. So, I mean, uh, what next do you think we need to do in this society that's changing, where people are talking publicly about stuff, where there's now alcohol-free drinks, and we talk um, to pubs and bars about how they treat customers equally? Which, for me, this is another equalities campaign. I can't help myself. Um, I, well, God bless you, Laura, for doing that. Thank you. It is so needed. It, it's immense fun as well. Um, if you like to be rebellious, then this is a great way to be rebellious, which is, you know, well, you've got vegan food on the menu. Why don't you have alcohol-free drinks? I mean, come on now. It's um, exactly that. Yeah. It's like being a vegetarian it's from a years ago. Preference, and it's great fun to play around with that, but also to see that it change can happen. It can happen quite quickly. Um, but so that's only one bit of what happens. But there's other people talking publicly about their drinking. It's moved away, I think, from being something that helps you sell a memoir, which is generally where it used to sit when you gave up drinking, 
into now something where people are talking about it on a daily basis and sharing experiences and sharing the journey on the way through. Where else do you think we can go with this? Do you, in terms of of um, sharing, you know, the benefits of changing your drinking habits? You know, I'm very passionate about this, and particularly because I I now have kids. Um, I, I really, I don't actually have a problem with people drinking or getting drunk. You know, we all, I don't like Coke. You know, we all do things, whatever. What I have a big problem about, and what my mission life mission is is to challenge the dishonesty around that narrative just like i was saying i was the 15 year old lying in my own vomit and everyone went oh that was a really good night no it wasn't no it wasn't it was horrible but nobody was telling me the truth so the way i want to approach this is um a cost benefit analysis when you uh, people, you know, will come to me all the time, like, I don't know if I have a problem. I don't know if I'm that bad enough. I just want to say, first of all, if you're in front of me, nobody's turned up in front of me by accident. <laughs> people who, people who don't have a drink problem, they're not Googling stuff. No. So I, I do a cost benefit analysis with people where, well, let's look at, let's look at the cost. So we look at how much money people spend, which is can be quite an eye opener. Um, and it's not just on alcohol, it's the related costs. It's yeah, I've halved my I live on half the salary I used to. Yeah, it's it's how much you know, on takeout pizza and taxis and all that kind of stuff. But the big thing that really gets people is time. How much time do you spend thinking about drinking, thinking about not drinking, drinking and recovering from drinking? Um, because we can get money back, we can't get time back. And that's particularly poignant if you're a parent. You know, how much time have you spent? Because it, when when I do this with people, it it's when we look at it that way, it's like the thing that we thought was this amazing thing quickly kind of was like, actually, it wasn't worth the 30 hours and $800 I spent this week or whatever. And then we look at what's the cost to your dignity? Do you have you ever behaved in ways that are not aligned with your true self? What's the cost to your relationships, to your integrity, to your authentic self? You're getting a good return on your investment. Because quite honestly, Laura, if someone says, you know, I'm I'm happy with that, crack on, you know, crack yeah. on. But you know what? Nearly I haven't actually I had anyone say that. Everybody, when we look at the cost. And then look, they look at what they perceive alcohol is bringing them. It begins to crumble. So I want to present that, first of all, uh, there's a not good return on investment. But the big thing was the alcohol lie, the perception that alcohol is the best way to get to the land of fun, excitement, belonging, connection, all that kind of stuff. Because, yes, you can, you can get there. There's always a cost. And for most people, I'm sure like we, we're the same. At the beginning of my drinking, I was there a lot more. And at the end of my drinking, I wasn't there very often, but I kept trying. So the, here's the thing. We can get to the land of fun, excitement, belonging, connection, relaxing, all of that stuff. We can get there sober and it's better. So yeah. I, I want my kids to grow up where not drinking is like being vegan you know if you were a vegan 40 years ago you were weird nobody catered for you maybe like there'd be one thing that someone could rustle up but you couldn't eat anywhere I want not drinking to be like that and I want to stop this bullying of like that I went through that I'm sure you went through that lots of people go through in their peer groups and in their their offices where people are like, well, you don't drink, like Ooh. all of that. I, I want all of that st to stop. So the people who drink and get drunk are clear on the cost and that the people who choose to be alcohol free are very clear that they're not missing out on anything. That's where I want to be. And I think we're beginning to get there yeah. very slowly, um, but certainly um, uh, that there are some foundations that we can build upon and that's really exciting. Um, and yeah, the more people that enter this discussion, you know, and the more people that share their stories, um, even for the, just the brief time that they may want to, you know, you, life moves on, you may decide to blog your experiences and then finish that after a year, but the year that you do blog will be useful to somebody. So, you know, yeah. never ever underestimate the power of sharing that story. And I have so many discussions with people who work in the drinks industry, 
um, all over about this. And um, and it's actually quite because so many people are talking about this now. It's quite odd when you get somebody who does say something different. You know, well, you can't possibly work behind a bar and not drink. And even younger bar staff now look at people who say that and go really that's that's weird that's not a normal behavior I also spoke to somebody today who said oh problem with alcohol free beers it tastes so terrible and I said when did you last try one? Oh, about 15 years ago I was like where have you been <laughs> you know there's there's things to look at I'm, I sent him away with a list of homework um and and he will find a good alcohol free beer <laughs> Yeah, I, I mean, I really want the, the biggest thing we have to change, and you're right, it is happening, is that uh, alcohol equals fun and sober equals boring. Whereas the truth is alcohol can be fun sometimes, but it always has a cost. And sobriety is the most exp expensive, amazing life that you could possibly imagine and will bring you all the things you want. That's the truth. And that's what I want people mm. to know. Yeah, and, and we've still got a long way to go. But my gosh, from when I stopped drinking, we, we you know, I, I, do you know what? I want to get a t-shirt. I'm thinking of it, putting like Soberfall, which is my brand on it and having, um, I'm having way more fun than you are on it. Definitely do it. <laughs> because that's the truth. I mean, and, and I see that again and again. In fact, I think it might have been in your group or one of the sober groups on Facebook. Someone talked about a wedding they went to. It was their first ever wedding. They're really nervous, blah, blah, blah. And then they recorded. They said it was awful. Like, like there was old people drunk that we were trying to like stop them falling over. There was a bridesmaid crying in the, the bathroom, the, the group, like, it was like awful, <laughs> but I bet all those people were going, Oh my God, that was an amazing wedding because that's how they've been programmed. Yeah, absolutely. I'm going to leave it there. Um, Veronica, we've come to time, but can I just thank you for another fascinating conversation? I feel like we've just had a catch up, but in front of people, but, um, but it's it's really important and um and for me it's also really important to be able to connect and hear from the professionals in this space because I'm not a coach and I'm not a um a therapist and I and and that's not a role that I particularly want to take, but I do like to lead change and so there are many ways to do that. And so by pulling people together in this people together from this space into things like the festival and podcasts and stuff like that we begin to create a narrative that's bigger than an individual person working here and for me that's incredibly exciting i, I completely agree and can i can i quickly plug my book yes you can so i have a book coming out it's coming out in january in the usa and in uh the uk it will be out in february it's called soberful and it's a program it's it's all about doing that in a deeper work it's all about how to get emotionally sober, how to have boundaries, how to deal with feelings, all of that kind of stuff. So it's a solution book. So um, it's ready for pre-order um, and it'll be out in the new year. Excellent. We'll make sure that we share that and also we do a regular book review. So make sure we'll Ooh, include that as well. Veronica, thank you. That'd be great. Cool. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you so much for your time. I'm going to end it here, everybody. So bye.